Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, we've got a real treat. Our friend Matthew Hunt is in the house. Matthew is an entrepreneur, coach, speaker, and founder of Demandy. Matthew has amassed a large following on LinkedIn because he helps CEOs solve a real problem. Specifically, Matthew and his company help busy B2B founders, CEOs create all their snackable content for social media platforms like LinkedIn and all within one and a half hours each month. Sounds pretty nifty to me. After battle testing this process with over 60 CEOs, he's created a LinkedIn demand generation system that is predictable and duplicatable. Matthew, welcome to the show. Really excited to learn more about what you have going on over at Demandy. Thanks, man. I love it. I love the radio voice too. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's a face for radio if you're watching it's a face for radio. <laughs> me, me too that's all yeah. right and fortunately now all the radio and podcasting also has video right <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. yeah yeah so i've been following you for quite some time I, i'm i'm gonna probably go back three four five years and you've okay. become more and more on my radar because of the big thing you talk about which is your snackable content so obviously very visible um, and because of that, um, and because of the vertical content you're creating, very attractive. Tell me a little bit more about your journey and how you got to where you are now, because based on your profile, you've been a founder for quite a while. Yeah, sure. Well, I think I'm one of those entrepreneurs that backed into it. You know, it was I never set out to be a business owner. Uh, however, looking back, if I really was honest with myself, I probably always was. And, and I think you can always tell if you are one or not is if you're pretty good at solving problems. You know, if you're a problem solver and you like fixing things. So if I look back early in my career when I was like had a job, you know, a J-O-B, I always tended to move towards management or leadership when I was always looking to fix things. And in fact, I'd, I'd bunt heads with pretty much every business owner or boss that I worked with because I never understood like, hey, you know, Mr. Boss, this thing is broken. And if we just do this thing, it's going to make things a lot easier. And, you know, <laughs> and so we didn't always get along with all my bosses yeah. to begin with. But over time, as I've matured and been humbled a little, one thing I've realized as being a business owner was they weren't dumb. <laughs> they weren't stupid as being a boss. What I didn't realize is they're sequencing and you can't fix all things that you need to fix in a business at, at at the time that you want to fix it, right? So, and 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 now being a business owner, three time business owner over the last you know twelve and a half years, I've realized, oh, you know, it, it must have been so painful for these individuals to know that parts of their business was not working or flowing the way they want it to, or know it could, or that it should, and they still couldn't fix it for insert all kinds of different reasons. And so, you know, looking back, I go, ah. They were they were much smarter than they I probably ever gave them credit for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like every it's, team member, they always look at the boss and they go, "What an idiot!" <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing, and it's interesting, you know, the <laughs> the piece there where it is really a balance between, you know, perfection and progress. Yeah, totally. Right? You know, I it's, think a lot of a lot of times people are so focused on everything has to be perfect, and so they don't they don't act, they yeah. don't move, they don't make that progress. It's so right. If you're trending right in the right direction and you give yourself enough time, you will get to where you want to go. And it's never going to look exactly the way you want it to be. But you're right. Looking at the trends and having a long time horizon is so important. You know, it's one just important for your like mental well being, <laughs> but it's also important for your team to develop that too. And also for your clients or your customers, everybody is the trend is really important. You know, because it's going to be all over the place. It's going to look like this. But if it's moving yeah. in that direction, you know, and and what's amazing, if you hit the right trend, like I always tell people, like I was not a very good, you know, specialist or manager or leader or business owner. But what I did get right was I was on the right trend for a number of years. So like when I started my first agency to go back, how did you start? 
you know, it was in 2007, I built my first landing page and taught myself how to do Google AdWords by reading a book um, written by Perry Marshall, The Definitive Guide to Google AdWords, you know, and I like totally was crushing it in my job by leveraging that, <laughs> that, that, that process. And then, you know, as it developed, I was like, I could do this for others. And then it led to other things because I just rode the tech train for the last 20 years. Like I'd almost have to be a complete moron to screw it up. Like, I mean, just, yeah, I'd have to be the stupid person in the village. You know what I mean? But if you're not the stupidest person in the village and you're in the right trend, you will do well, no matter what, even being bad at it, because I have been terrible at all of those things along the way and still did well. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's hope yeah. for I you. Think, if you're the stupidest yeah. person in the village, hit the right trend. You'll be all right. You might be being a little but humble there, but that's good. You because they don't want to do it either. <laughs> well, or they just don't know. So like, for example, this is what's even interesting about the, th I've had three agencies now. And what's interesting is, so one was in, in search, like marketing. SEO, pay-per-click, small businesses for the first four years. Then I did the same thing, but for enterprise. And the other reason I switched was because I had the epiphany of like, it's the same work, but you can charge about 50 times more, right? So instead of five grand per month, you can charge 50 grand per month. You're like, that's a better deal for the same work. Why not move up market, right? But what's interesting between the first one, the second one, the third one is this, is the first agency, nobody had the skills yet. So when you were hiring people, you couldn't hire people who were in SEO. You couldn't hire someone who knew how to manage pay-per-click ads. You had to train them and teach them. So it was a really different problem. But fast forward five years later, now we're 15 years into this. You can hire amazing talent who is fully trained, who has all their training wheels off, out of the gates and hit the ground running. Like nothing could be easier than building like an SEO agency. There's a million SEOs <laughs> or, or people who know how to use Google AdWords or Facebook, and they've already done it on hundreds of businesses and made already the mistakes. Like how easy is that? Matthew, you work with a lot of leaders, obviously. What mm -hmm. are some of the, the issues that you see as a recurring theme with these leaders, whether it be with their personal brand, with leadership within their company? Uh, I'm guessing that there, there's a couple of reoccurring trends that you see with most of your clients. Yeah. So, so most of our clients know they need to create content and have a presence online today with short form and long form content, just like you guys are doing it right now. Like everybody gets it. And most of the time they even know how to do it or what it kind of, what good looks like versus bad looks like, or what their preferences are. Their biggest obstacle every single time is time. They're busy people. <laughs> So, so that's really, you know, what it is like the, the major thing why people use our services has less to do about the ROI that it's driving as opposed to the ROT because return on time is way more important to them. So, you know, like a simple form of just figuring out it's this, it's like, let's just say, I, it, it, you just ask the CEO, like, what's your effective billing rate? Assuming that you did hourly billing, nobody does it. Cause there's like, that's not a good plan of finding leverage, but let's just say you did. They're like, yeah, 500 bucks an hour. Okay, that's a pretty reasonable number for an executive or a coach or a consultant to charge. It's very standard. You'd say, okay, well, it, how long is it going to take you to create your snackle content every single day? Like, well, and they're going to be like 30 minutes to an hour. That's about what it takes. Like, it's never just five minutes. You got to get in the zone. You got to think about it. You got to do all this other stuff. You know, then you got to like optimize it, find the image, the GIF. Like, you know, there's stuff that needs to be done. So if you're actually going to commit to it, which they know they need to do, they need to commit to this to make it work. They're going, well, that's like 20 hours a month, like five business days a week, right? 20 hours a month. Even if they batched it, it's still going to be like a day. Well, that's like 10 grand worth of their time that they could be applying to something else or finding more leverage. So I go, well, look, with us, it's 2,500 bucks. You just saved yourself 7,500 bucks right away. It's a good return on your time. So once they get that concept, they're like, oh, I'm in. And then all the other side benefits come with it. And the side benefits that come with it is this, is like, look, they're going to get media trained and be held accountable. Because the reality is until someone holds you accountable, until you practice something, you're not going to get better at it. And just the fact of getting interviewed on a regular basis with someone who's prepared privately in a setting makes you a more effective communicator. And when you become a more effective communicator, everything in your life gets better. Your relationships with your kids get better. Your relationship with your partner gets better. Your relationship with your team gets better. You keep your team longer. You train your team better. Your relationship with your clients gets better. You get more upsells, right? You become a better, more effective communicator publicly. Bigger opportunities come because now you're a lean, mean, sound by machine. 
who do you want to have on your podcast? Someone who speaks well, who's entertaining, who speaks in sound bites, who makes complicated things simple, right? <laughs> like, where do you think that comes from? It comes from practicing in private with an accountable coach, with like someone who's going to hold you accountable. So, so the next biggest benefit is that they become media trained to become more uh, a more effective communicator. The other benefit is they get to publicly test their messaging to their ICPs in public. And it's not only necessarily even their clients, like their side benefits of like keeping your team and touching your team. The reality is most leaders are so busy that they're not spending enough time with all the people that matter in their lives, like their team, like their managers. But if you multiply yourself and put it on the internet, everybody's secretly creeping you. They're watching you. You're the leader. You're the CEO. You are the founder. So if we duplicate you and more consistently get you out there in the web publicly, then people consume it. It feels like another touch point. So it feels like you're spending time with them. You're doing training without having to do training, right? And then at the same time, you might pent out because you now you sent out 240 to 365 messages in a year. You're going to find that you discovered 24 to 30 amazing unicorn posts. And what I mean by unicorn posts, it means it spoke perfectly to your ideal audience or your ICP where it hit them in the heart, the gut, and the funny bone. And then now you can peel and stick it and it becomes an evergreen piece. You can use it for sales and movement, emails, newsletters, themes, inspiration, all kinds of other places. And next year, when you restart, you're now starting on a foundation of growth where you're building upon unicorns versus building upon donkeys. Like social media is here today and gone tomorrow. It's about testing. It's about top of mindness. It's about building your audience and your following and building trust. And so the reality is we just want to do this. We just want to build trust and community with our people internally, externally, anything that creates leverage to do that, we win. And so once you start understanding these principles, because these are principles, then you can start applying what we bring to the table, which is the frameworks on how to make it better, faster, because we have the frameworks and thinking on how to do it on how to do the prompts. And then we can get into like, obviously with time, we talked about this a little earlier in the podcast, if you're trending in the right direction, it compounds and gets better. Because the more and more you do it, each, you know, each month, day, year, it gets better and better. And even when our clients first come on, I always tell them, like, if you make a win, like everybody comes in, they're like, I want to make more money and I want the ROI and I want the return on investment. And I'm going to want to be, you know, Gary V. like insert whatever weird aspirations that everybody has in their head. It's like most of them are totally like ridiculous and not possible, mostly because they're just learning how to run their own damn business. Like they're getting their yeah. training tools off. Like, you know, like yeah. they don't know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Which is totally okay. It doesn't, that's fine. I didn't know. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't share. We should share and just be honest about where it is. And this is the same thing that we teach people of like, you know, when they're creating content, the biggest mistake people make is they try to give advice mm-hmm. instead of sharing experiences. And that's the fastest way to get canceled and shut down and look like a dumb dumb you know, is to give advice. They, well, they try to be like the Simon Sinek's of the world, right? <laughs> what one of the things it's, I, your plotted two quotes not gonna work, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What what I think is interesting, one of the kind of terms you threw out there that I think a lot of times people don't think through is your return on time. Your return you on know, time. So, so, so many that. people talk about return on investment and this is what I need to do, but so many people realize that your most valuable thing in life is time. And so many people are wasting it on things that they're not qualified to do. They don't like to do. They're not ever going to be greatly skilled at it. And so they don't, but they're too, you know, proud or just haven't thought about using people that are going to be 10 times better, 10 times more efficient. So they can focus on the things that they bring most value. The most, the most, the people who make the most money or appear successful, if we're going to assume that that's success, everybody's definite. I don't really actually think that's success personally for myself, but most people do in the world are like, yeah, this person's successful. Uh, Jeff Bezos is successful. He's the you know, richest man in the world or whatever. You get the idea. You're one of the richest men. Yeah. But the, the, the people who do that are, they are the best at finding the most leverage and they're the best at managing their time. If you look at the universal of like, why are they more successful? They've mastered that better than you have. Mm-hmm. And they've also mastered leveraging people who are smarter than them. They hire people who are smarter than them. They are always the dumbest person in the room. So they've mastered their time. They've mastered leverage and they've mastered hiring really smart people. They're not trying to be the talent. They're trying to be the best talent scout. It's different thinking. And so if you can master those things, those principles, those laws, then it doesn't matter what you touch, you know, 99.99% of the time, you're going to be super successful in what you do. That's it. That's all you're trying to figure out. Yeah. And this is what one piece of it, like personal branding, you can't outsource a hundred percent. It's still got to be you. It's called personal 
<laughs> but but most of it you can outsource. Like if you are spending more than an hour and a half on it per month, it's probably too much time, especially for stuff that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. You're testing. You're going to post 365 posts in a year, one per day, and you're going to get 36 that are unicorns and the rest are going to be donkeys. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like it's an exercise, an hour and a half, an hour to co-create it with someone who's really smart with a good copywriter, someone who can go do the tedious stuff, 30 minutes to approve it, move on. There's other more important things to do in your business or in your life. I love you know, and eventually sure. you can spend more, like it may be your Gary V and you, do, and then you start documenting, you have a team, but most people can't afford that. Like when you look at like Gary V or you look at like Alex from or any of these people, and you actually dig into the books, Tom from, you know, all these shows they're spending, you know, between 50 and a hundred thousand dollars per month, just documenting their own stuff with their team. And that's not all realistic. So yes, there's time, but there's also like realistic budgets that you can afford in, in your life. So you have to realize kind of like where you are. And I think for most people and their goals, most people change their lives if they just get more consistent on a regular basis with their existing warm network, because they already have a network. They already know people who know them and like them and trust them. They just need to remind them that they exist. And so just being consistent gets you more referrals, more business within that network. Like a lot of times even when a client starts publishing with us, that's the first thing they experience. They're like, oh, I just got like three referrals because they said they saw my stuff. It's like, well, yeah, because you weren't posting before you, you, you or you post and you ghosted or, or it was inconsistent. Like you don't know what's going to connect with people to or when. And then the other one is like, sometimes they'll even hear like, oh, I just got this guy. I spoke to him two years ago. I forgot about him, but he came back into my you know pipeline or I worked with this guy at this company and they canceled us, but now he's at a new company. It's like that was work they had already done, but they didn't get to capitalize on the work that they previously done because they were not consistent. And so I always say this, people, it's not even about the content being great because consistent B plus content outperforms, you know, inconsistent A plus content. And so many of them let perfection get in the way of progress. You know, this, this 80% of done is better than not done. And I had to learn that lesson myself. I lost two years of growth in one of my agencies because we couldn't get to our own marketing. And I, and I couldn't get over the fact of this because I was a marketing agency and I, I, I was like, I'm not outsourcing my stuff to another marketing agency. Like, what does that say about my marketing agency? Like how embarrassing. So one, I was ashamed of it. And then two, even when I did it, like was wanting to do it, I always hated like what they did. It didn't feel like my voice. It didn't feel like it was on brand. It felt like all of these things, but eventually after two years of not getting it done and my, my, one of my co-partners said like, yo, dude, like we're not getting it done. And it's the common story. The cobbler's kids goes with no shoe story. Like I was so busy taking care of our team. So busy taking care of our clients is the number one priority. I was bringing my leftovers back to our own stuff. But once I hired a company then I had to be accountable because I was paying them. It's amazing what happens when you pay someone a decent amount of money. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I better do my homework. But when you don't have to pay anyone, you ignore it. And then did I like it? I hated it. But at the end of the day, we grew. I thought it was terrible. I didn't think it was good. I was embarrassed by it. I hated every minute of it. But the fact is we grew and we didn't grow before that. Two years of missed opportunity because I didn't outsource it to someone else and because I couldn't get over my own damn ego and my own damn hang hangups. And this is a common story that many, many, many people are going through on a regular basis. In fact, my number one client is other marketing agencies. 75% of my clients are marketing agency CEOs who do marketing for other people, but they come to me to do their marketing for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they don't even like what I do for them all the time, but they stay because I hold them accountable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And because it's a return of their time and it's working. Like, so it's funny, right? They, they, they'll be like, you're awesome, but I, you know, I don't quite like this. It doesn't quite feel it, but are you going to quit? No. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> yeah yeah totally totally and someone who holds them because the breakthrough is often it's like it's kind of like the you know the if you think of like you know you're pushing the big boulder up the mountain and then you get to the top of the mountain but it takes all the way and then all of a sudden it's that has that snowball effect where it just rolls down on its own the problem is people push it all the way up they get right to the top and they give up just before they get over that edge and that accountability partner really helps you get over the edge and then it starts rolling and the reality is that the time horizon is not very like long for most people and so i always look at it like this like 
if you're talking about what your goals are in the next year and, and what success looks like, you're probably focused on tactics. If you're talking about your goals in two years, you're probably starting to think about, you know, a little bit of strategy. If it's three years and beyond, it's vision. It's probably vision. And you need the vision to carry you through and be anchored in that. And there's a really good book about this written by Cameron Harold, uh, who's a client of mine. It's called Vivid Vision. And it's a fantastic book. Every entrepreneur should read it. It takes maybe like honestly two hours on a weekend to, to read it. And it just helps you get this vision clear and extend your time horizon. Because if you have a longer time horizon, you'll be more patient with it. It goes back to the same stuff with like uh, when Bill Gates said, you know, we greatly underestimate, you know, um, what we can get done in a decade, but we greatly overestimate what we think we can get done in a year. It happens every single time. It's a time horizon problem, you know? And so it's, it's the ability to extend that time horizon. And those that have that vision and that anchor and see, can push through. And as long as they're on trend, like we talked about before in the right trend, they will eventually go. And as long as they're working on things that are evergreen. So you just ask yourself these filters. Will this work today? And will it work in 50 years from now? Yes. Did it work 50 years before this? Yes. Personal branding has always been a thing. <laughs> you know, it's done differently in different formats, but it's all, everyone's, everyone has a personal brand, even if it's just like a private community, like look at like even personal branding in like private communities, like golf clubs, ski clubs, supper clubs, you, the yacht club, your personal branding, you're going around, you're networking, you insert whatever. This is just done publicly versus it doing privately. It's, it's always been there. So it's evergreen. Okay. Two, the more I do it, does it get better? Yes, it's so it compounds. It leverages the law of compound, compounding. And like Einstein said, those who understand compound interest earn it. Those that don't pay it. He also called it the eighth wonder in the world. We should be paying attention to this. This is a law, a principle, right? And so if you use these as the filters, like go, is it evergreen? Does it compound? Does it provide leverage for me where it multiplies me and gives me a better return on my time? If the answer is yes, 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 then you should do it and invest in it. And not think about anything else. Everything else is a side benefit that's better. And if you could say yes to those things, then there's no reason why you wouldn't invest in it. You have to be literally insane not to. Amen. Or or you're really irresponsible for your own life and for your company's life. Because I, I believe, mark your words, people are waking up. And even though this has like already been 15 years in the making with social media and other stuff, that if you are a founder or a CEO in the future and you do not have a personal brand, it'll be frowned upon and irresponsible. I wouldn't even give someone my money to invest in their company if they didn't take this seriously. Yes, I love that. I know it sounds harsh, but it is what it is. Like, like what do you can do? Hide behind your desk. Find someone who's going to be the face of the company that you can stretch it far and wide because we buy from people and we want to follow people. And, you know, and honestly, you should teach everybody in your company to do it too. I know people are scared to do this sometimes, but the smart companies are catching wind of this and understanding the new way of, of social is social selling and through creators and your team and teaching them to have the courage and giving them the skills to do this and share more. Because the reality is if your team just shares your messaging, if they just literally say the same thing you say, but they do it, you will attract infinitely more net new people. Why? Because it wasn't you. Like there are people who are going to get on here and they're like, I don't like the tone of his voice or dude, I used to date someone who looked like him. He's a total, like they're going to hate me. And there's other people who are just going to love me. They were like, they just connect with it. But if I take the same message and I give it to someone else on my team, like Jeevan, well, she's has a different audience. She looks different, sounds different, has different tones, saying the same information attracts a net new audience that compounds towards my organization. So even if, so the next level is like, not only now you've duplicated yourself, how do you do that with everybody? And this is what's going to happen in the future. This is the trend we're on with AI and everything else. What's going to happen is we're going to start making one person's ability to be able to do things times 10. And so we're going to have deflation in the, how many people you need, but you're going to hire really, really smart people who are really open to who are courageous and creative and you're going to give them you're going to hire me to help them multiply them and you're going to use ai to give them infinite assistance and agents to be able to just do all this work in the background for them to make that really 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 smart person really really efficient and and everyone's gonna have to learn these new skills but that that's literally what's what's going to happen you know and the companies that figure out are going to be able to build these like crazy companies for like 10 people it's gonna be like 100 million dollars a year, 10 people. You'd be like, how is this possible? It's like, yeah, that's how. Because <laughs> they understand yeah, these principles. People. 
Really smart people. Yeah, you want to hire the smartest damn person ever and give them every tool in the book and let them go do that thing. And if they just do the same thing that you're doing, like I mean, imagine you know, imagine as a founder or CEO, if you could just multiply yourself like that through people and through you know AI and through these mass media tools that you have, like you're unstoppable. And it's never been easier or cheaper to do. Matthew, you talked about vision there for a while. And to me, I'm in marketing clients every day. And I oftentimes will ask them, what is your vision? And if I'm fortunate to be in person with them or on Zoom, every single time, and I'm not kidding, every single time the client does this look around where they kind of turn their head and they're they're thinking, they're trying to think of an answer real quick and I'll call them out and I'll say, you don't have a vision or they will no, 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 I I have one. It's, you know, I want more downloads. I want more subscribers. I want to grow my business. I said, well, all I heard you say was I want, I want, I want. Now that's not a plan, not a goal, not a strategy. Yeah. I think that the vision is as important as anything, but I would say whether it's one year, two year, five years down the road, you need a vision, a strategy and an implementation plan, right? Totally. Yeah. This is another reason why that works toward what, what you're going to do every day. Totally. It's, this is why I tell people all all the time that they should read that book, Vivid Vision, because it goes through the process on, on how to go about doing this. And, and if you do look at all the different companies out there, whether it was like Nike or, you know, Microsoft or, you know, Google, you know, it's, they have clear visions. Like Microsoft was like, put a computer in every home. Right. And, and, you know, Google's was to make, make the world's information accessible at your fingertips, right. Make it like, there's a bigger mission at, at point. And so you have to figure out what yours is. It doesn't have to be as big as that, but for sure you need to like understand it. It needs to be based on like your, your, your customers, not yourself, not like you said, not the I statement. Right. And so for, for ours, ours is like very simple. We, 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 you know, I chose, I chose this actually this third time around. So what I did realize after having three businesses is for me, I had this opinion, I'm like, oh, businesses come and go, like life changes. So I was like, when I build the next one, I want to make sure whatever I build it towards is the audience is an audience that I that I love and that I'm always going to like enjoy being around. So I thought about this because I did small businesses, I did enterprise, and then I looked around like what I was doing in my extra hours. I was like, oh, I was really hanging around with other entrepreneurs and founders. I just love them. I think they're just a special people. And I just think that these, these entrepreneurs and particularly the ones who are building B2B businesses, I was really kind of hanging out with that made my friends. I created my own communities. I was going to these other things. I was like, I just love these people. Like they're just amazing people. And like all entrepreneurs, they're, they're in pain. They're doing so much. Right. And the stories are similar. And so I was like, okay, whatever I do, I think no matter what I sell, I could probably build a trust and community with the group group of people that are b2b business owners and i think from now to the end of my career no matter what i if i as long as i speak to them i'm going to be good and so that was a choice right and then for this company as we went through and i was discovering this the the way i discovered even the product was i actually just came up with a, a couple ideas that i didn't build anything and i went to my network and i said here's the thing that i'm thinking of building it's in beta do you want to pay me to do this? It'll be half the price that you pay me, right? It was like, it basically was like, I said, 1300 bucks. I was like, it's just me and an EA. <laughs> and it was great is when you get the fact check, the validate it with them voting on their, with their wallets, <laughs> right? which is good. Cause if people aren't going to give you money, there's no point in building anything. I had no landing page, no nothing. We went through the process. It was a bit clunky, but because you use the insert, the word beta, everyone knows it's going to be like not perfect. And so they got more value than they got for the 1300 bucks per month to do it. And we worked the first year, we just kind of worked through it. It was just me and the EA and got like 20 clients doing this. I was like, okay, I think it's time to hire a team. Then we start going about the vision and we start, so for our vision, we started realizing, okay, look, you know, successful entrepreneurs in the world make the world a better place. I truly, truly believe that, you know, they, they literally, they, they, they move the economy. Like, what would we do with our small business owners and our entrepreneurs? You know, what would we do? Like, how many jobs has Google created, right? How many, how much more better is the world because of this, of a search engine? Like, this is, this is important. The problem is, you know, 
there's a lot of anxiety with the CEOs, you know, and the founders who do this, there's a lot of highs and lows, they're stressed out, right? And if we can remove some of that stress for them, they're going to be clearer and happier and more successful. And so what could be our little part that does that? And, and this is where we found our little, our little carve, our little niche. And this is why we talk about return on time. This is why we talk about these greater principles and not really talk about necessarily about getting more business, more clients, or more about you and your brand. It's a, it's a different approach to everything, but that's what makes us unique. And now because we have a mission, that's a greater purpose <laughs> than just making money or, or getting more clients or, making the next viral post or whatever insert silly thing, you know, is going to last longer and it's going to allow us to create, you know, a bigger picture of what's going on. So I hear you on vision. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's just, it, I, maybe I'm realizing as it's becoming more important to me as I have a personal vision, I have business vision for things I want to achieve this year, yeah. not just goals, but 2023 will have been a great year if I achieve X, if X happens. So I yeah. love that. I, I want to transition though a little bit to um, why personal brand. And before I do that, I, I tell a lot of my clients that, and when I'm speaking, I often say personal brand is important because of this. And one of my statements is my reasonings, I should say, is that as a consumer, me, Chris Burns, as a consumer, yeah. I don't really have any type of emotional, physical connection to any brand. And I, I've challenged people in, in the audience and some people will say, well, I like Apple because of simplicity and durability and the UI UX. And I said, well, that's great. You like Apple. You said you like, but do you have a connection to that company? Do you feel physically or emotionally connected? And the answer is always no. And so when I look at the people that we are, the businesses we're connected to, it's usually someone in the business that you're connected to. Sure. And it's based on a personal brand. So I, you named Gary Vaynerchuk. I certainly feel that. Um, anybody from the Shark Tank, big fan of Tony Robbins, et cetera, totally. et cetera. And what I've always said is I think so many businesses get this wrong in that they try to sell a product to an audience they don't have. Rather, when you build the personal brand, if you have that audience and you have those advocates, they're going to want to do business with you as a byproduct because you've done nothing but add so much value to their newsfeed. Totally. Do you think your your clients get that? I mean, do they, they understand that outcome and what are some of the other benefits that they want to do this with you for? Yeah. Well, there's, there's, a, there's so many and we can go down the laundry list of them all, but I think you, you, the first point that you made was important and, and you can prove this just simply like, cause you can go like, okay, Elon Musk has 50 million followers, but Tesla has 10. It's not that there isn't value in the brand, right? But it just show, yeah. it just shows you like the power of that. And then you can even look at it this: you know, Elon Musk cares so much about personal branding, you know, and controlling the narrative and the messaging. And I've seen that he spent a lot of money to buy a social media network, right? The yeah. one where he gets the most attention. Like th that, there's a big reason for buying it, right? To have that control where he was losing control beforehand, right? By by being edited or, you know, now you can control it. <laughs> Isn't that, that's a big, big thing in your favor. So it's pretty freaking important. And, and, and companies have been using this for a long time. They just used to do it through traditional media versus new media. You know, like Warren Buffett has always like had a personal brand. He just did it on panels and at conferences and through the traditional media and the traditional finance channels. Is he super active as a brand yet on social media? No, but he's like 90 years old. Like, of course he's not, right? But fast forward to 2023, this is what we do. This is the new media. Like where are people's eyeballs and where they are? And so we are in an age today where you need to find leverage and we're all fighting for attention and we're all fighting for eyeballs. And the more eyeballs that you can get towards you, the better it's going to be. It's not just eyeballs. It's more about connecting with a group of people, you know, building trust at a one-to-many level with that, with that community. And the reality is once you have that trust with the community, you literally have a license to print money. And so the old way would have been product first, people second, including with your marketing. The new way is people first, product second. My third business, we talked about this a minute ago. What did I do? <laughs> I had the relationships already 
and I got them to give me money before I built anything, <laughs> then I built the product, right? Much better process. Like, trust trust yeah. me, I built this business faster than I built any other business profitable from day one without building a single thing. No landing page, no website, no business card, no nothing. But I had a bit of a foundation to follow on by having a bit of a community, a bit of influence, a little bit of, you know, rapport with some people. They're willing to take a chance with me with a DM to them in a quick phone call of 15 minutes, calling it beta. Like that's pretty impressive, right? That's what you can do with that. And so the larger that community is, you know, and the closer it is, the, the easier it is for you to be able to make money. Now, this leverage allows you to communicate at a one-to-many level as well too. So just like being up on stage, you know what I mean? Like you're going to be positioned and seen as as the expert. This is all all you're doing, but you get to do it with your team, with your loved ones. You get to do it with future business. What most people don't understand is it does take time. And so a lot of times they come to this thinking, a year later, I'm going to be Gary V. And that's not true. Yeah. Look at what Gary V has been doing. He's been doing it for 15 years. He's been doing it with his first business. Like this is not, this has not been an overnight journey at, at, at all an overnight success. Like he has been doing it for a long time. And even like you look at Joe Rogan, like for you guys have a podcast. I always tell people, Hey, don't worry about your podcast sucks. Do your first 100 episodes before you even call it, get a hundred in the can. That's just your training wheels to find your voice, to find your rhythm, become a better interviewer, a better host, all of those things. And I go, just go back and look at Joe Rogan's first podcast. Like it was not what he is today. He is an incredible host. He's very disarming. He's an amazing listener. You know, he has very interesting guests on his platform. That's why Spotify was going to give him a hundred million dollars, right? Just to license his stuff on the platform. There's a lot of power in that, but, but it, it took 10 years. That just happened like uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. You know, it took Overnight him 10, success. Yeah, 10 years to get there. So the problem is he probably did not see very much money for a long time, but he stuck, he stuck with it. And so, you know, this is what it is. It compounds and it's just like compound interest. Like go ahead and look at like even go and look at uh, Warren Buffett's wealth and put it into a bar graph and look, look at it over time. You're going to see that, oh, he did not make a lot of money or did, I mean, he still had millions, but but don't get me wrong, like it didn't look like billions, right? Until the last 15, 20 years. So he's 90, you know, it wasn't until he was 70 before you, you, you saw it shooting through the roof, you know? So again, it comes back to this theme that we're talking about today is this, this time horizon and expectations and understanding these laws of compound interest. But but you, if you get this and, these, and once you get it you, and you stick with it, you'll never stop doing it and nor should you. You know, I think it's just find an audience that you're just going to always love to help and speak to one that makes you happy. <laughs> well, that's, the, that's the trick. <laughs> if that's the case, you'll never feel like you're working because you yeah, truly know what you do. That, totally. That's a great way to, to wrap yeah. it up. Th this conversation yeah. could easily go on for hours. And I wish, I wish we didn't, we had the time and didn't have something right after this, but I'm very thankful that you joined the show today. Before we let you go, can you tell people where they can find you and a little bit more about your company, Demandy? Sure. Yeah. There's only two places you can find me on purpose. You can go to demandy.com. So that's demand. And then it ends with two eyes.com. Or you can go to LinkedIn. It's the only social media website that I'm active on and, and there. And I am very active. And if you message me or comment or follow me, you can get me there. And uh, maybe one day I'll expand beyond those two things. But right now, that's all I need to be able to achieve my current goals. And so those are the only two places you'll need me. <laughs> hey, and that, that's another great takeaway is you're focusing on quality over quantity. Yeah. Totally. And, you know and where just, your audience is, and that is where you are. And I, I love that as a final yeah. thought. Just as we wrap up, that was a great conversation. Be a marketing person. I, I love to talk to marketing people, especially personal brand operations. And uh, I hope we can have you back on the show again soon. That'd be awesome. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dustin. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading, subscribing. We appreciate your ears. Have a great day. Peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30-day Hustle Challenge. 
Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.